All right, um, last kind of set of things is uh, something that I just feel, I have to sort of go through these because I feel like I have to disabuse you of certain things that you've been, you've been taught. So, so one thing is, you've probably heard about the Keynesian multiplier. So here's John Maynard Keynes. Um, uh, he was sort of a rock star uh, economist of the early 20th century. Um, and one of the basic hypotheses that he came up with was the idea that an increase in net government spending is going to increase GDP by more than the amount of the spending. So, um, you know, the idea is if the government spends a dollar today, you're going to create two dollars worth of, of prosperity and economic activity. That was his, his idea. And furthermore, if the government can invest in, uh, uh, actually invest in capital, uh, like infrastructure, that you can create even more, uh, and kind of create even more uh, 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 growth uh, and economic activity. Um, there are a lot of studies out there that try to measure uh, what the Keynesian multiplier is. Uh, the problem is it's, it's really hard to do it. And the reason is that these Keynesian uh, interventions, big government increases in monetary policy or in, in fiscal policy, tend to happen during a time when the economy is in a cyclical, kind of in a cyclical downturn. And then when the cycle reverses, you get increased growth, but you don't know whether you can't attribute it to the government spending. You don't know whether it's due to the government spending or whether it would have happened anyway. And so um, there's a, a, a lot of problems with the Keynesian multiplier, both empirically and also in theory. I mean, here's one example, right? So if people are forward-looking, then financing government spending with current taxes or current deficits is going to have the same effect in the economy. It doesn't matter whether you tax people or whether you run deficits. And the reason is that you think about what people might do. The question for Keynes is who's going to buy the government bonds that finance spending? And would that money uh, have been spent elsewhere. So if I think about the government raising debt, uh, and then the individual says, well, this debt's going to have to be repaid, going to have to be repaid sometime. What am I going to do with the money? Am I going to go shopping and spend it, or am I going to save it? I'm going to save it, and this is pretty much what happened during COVID. And instead, I'm going to sit home, and I'm going to watch Netflix. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to save the money. In fact, only 15% of people uh, after COVID said that they would spend their stimulus checks. Um, so essentially, there are real problems with just assuming that every dollar injected into the economy is going to be forward-looking. Okay, Scott's standing up and he's telling me I need to take, have time for questions, or are you just taking off? Are you? Oh, okay, okay. All right, fine. I do want to say one other thing, though, uh, which is I just want to talk about what happens um, with uh, income taxes and uh, distortions of the, uh, of the economy. So uh, anybody heard of the Laffer curve? You know what the Laffer curve? Okay. So the Laffer curve is this idea that uh, if you tax people, have higher income taxes on people, uh, then they're going to eventually, they're going to work less and you're going to reach a point where increasing taxes is counterproductive even from the perspective of just raising revenue. So that's the Laffer curve. The Laffer curve shows the theoretical relationship between tax revenue and the tax rate. So there's some rate here, T star, which maximizes government revenue. And so uh, Laffer, Art Laffer is an economist who came up with this uh, idea, emphasized this idea that, hey, it might be that by cutting taxes we might be able to bring in more government revenue. Um, he was given the Presidential uh, Medal of Honor by Donald Trump, and then immediately as though on cue, the New York Times wrote something called The Dangerous Folly of Lafferism. Okay, so um, very interesting. I don't know whether they assessed Laffer on his own uh, basis or not, but I actually also have some trouble with, with, with Lafferism, I have to tell you. Um, the Laffer curve is only optimal in a very narrow sense. Uh, government revenue, it tells you what would maximize government revenue with a single tax rate. And, you know, the, the real problem is, what about overall production and prosperity? To get to the top of the Laffer curve involves so much discouraged economic activity, so much lost prosperity. And there's research that goes back a long time that shows that for every dollar of uh, increased gov government revenue, that there's a deadweight loss of $2 in the economy. So, so the goal, so I actually think there's also a problem with Lafferism, which is that it sets a very, very narrow goal. Its goal is, let's maximize government revenue. That's not the goal. The goal should be, let's optimize and maximize economic prosperity for everybody. And so, um, no question that the rate that would maximize government revenue is higher than the rate that would be optimal for economic prosperity. So, okay, that's it. Um, what's the appropriate size of government? That's for you to determine. You're the voters, but at least we've gained some facts about uh, what exactly the current size of government is and what some of the issues are. Overreach in any of the areas that I talked about, the rule of law, the social safety net, the provision of public services when there aren't really danger of public failures, any, any overreach there is going to lead to, uh, lead to dangers for society. And, uh, you know, this is a great graph 
uh, from Kevin Williams, or a great picture from Kevin Williamson, the National Review, or maybe the National Review uh, journalists put it on there. Uh, he wrote, the coronavirus will be the Leviathan's enabler. Coronavirus has certainly led to a huge increase in government, in the size of government. And uh, in some ways, you'll hear from Scott, a lot of it is about intrusion to people's individual lives uh, and into their health. Uh, I tend to focus on the intrusion into the economy, which has been uh, vast, and there's been very substantial overreach there. So um, I will leave a few minutes for questions. Okay, I'll take some questions. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for this very interesting lecture, uh, especially when you talked about unemployment benefits and how that creates an implicit tax rate that creates a disincentivizing mechanism. I was wondering whether um, college financial aid creates that same mechanism whereby middle class families, you know, it's very hard for them to get a huge amount of financial aid, that if they decrease the total household income in aggregate once they get the aid, it would actually be more. So I was just wondering whether that concept applies there as well. Yes, uh, you know, I have known people and heard of people who have literally done things like taken unpaid sabbaticals and things like that in order to increase the amount of financial aid that they can get uh, based on, you know, in financial aid income statements. Now that, you know, that is, and that is a clear example of the type of distortion that you have in mind. That's pretty extreme, um, but that's, that is another example. The cost of, of college in the United States is very, very high and qualification for the programs is based on income and goes down when people earn more. And, and there, are, there are definitely uh, 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 at least journalistic accounts of people who have exploited that to a great extent. I haven't seen an actual like, large-scale study that asks how much has that cost the U.S. economy, but it's a great question. Yep. Uh, over here. I'm trying to get broad, broad hear from people I haven't heard from yet. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the political business cycle and how you think electoral incentives might impact either increases or decreases in spending or those redistributive uh, tax policies. Well, on uh, I'll say on, on deficits, uh, both parties have been really bad, uh, and uh, there's not going to be any much excuse there. And the beginning of uh, sort of first half of the COVID response was under a Republican administration, and the second half was under a, a, a Democratic administration. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, the political uh, cycle, it's kind of it's kind of hard to say. Um, and the reason it's hard to say is it certainly is true that the, that, uh, the Democrats want to do more uh, social spending. There's no question about that. But these crises are so important because during the crises, that's when government spending really ratchets up. And there, it doesn't seem to matter whether a Republican or Democrat administration is in, is in office. Government spending ratchet, ratchets up hugely. So, um, so I think that's kind of the way to think about it. Maybe the, the, the Democrats are more, um, uh, tend to increase government spending on a, on a gradualistic basis. But during crises, it just goes up. So, okay, you can, you can take this question. Right? You need to just, yeah. um, I was hoping, I was wondering if you could expand on your point earlier that the top 1% earn 20% of the revenue, but pay 40% of the total taxes. I, I guess I'm just wondering, how, how does that work? How is that possible? Okay, well, it's possible by the fact that the uh, upper income people have a higher tax rate face a higher tax rate than lower income people. So um, if you earn uh, over a certain amount of money per year, then you actually pay a higher tax rate. Um, so like in California, for example, a top tax rate in California is 13.3%. Um, people earning over a million dollars pay that rate. If you earn between 500,000 and, uh, and a million, you pay either 11.3% or 12.3% depending on your marital status. So that's an example of progressive income taxation. That's, that's how it happens. Yep. Hi, thank you for this lecture. Um, I just wanted to address um, your comments about inequality in the United States. Um, obviously, there's one discussion to be had about the flows of income, um, and so revenue, and as it's you know people making money, but there's a separate discussion to be had about money making money, um, because the wealth gap between the top 5% and the bottom 5% has more than doubled since um, 1989, between 1989 and 2016. Um, so if we're going to have a discussion about inequality in the United States, I just wanted to ask you to address that side of it rather than just the, the flow side, more of the stock side as well, because that's, you know, an important part of it. Right. So um, wealth inequality, you know, actually, I, I don't agree with your statistics necessarily. It depends on what measures of wealth inequality you use. 
and um, there are various measures of wealth inequality that attempt to back out how much people, uh, the problem is there's no public disclosure, there's no disclosure to the government of how much wealth a person has and, uh, in the United States. And so economists do a lot of trying to back that information out by looking at things like they try to get access to tax returns and they try to estimate based on the tax return what the person's wealth is. That is a really tricky exercise. And depending on what assumptions you make in there, you can get a lot of different answers about how wealth inequality has evolved over time. So I am sort of skeptical about the idea that wealth inequality has exploded. Um, another issue is that, uh, you know, um, when you think about uh, wealth that people have, you know, the, the fact that every individual has got uh, the right to Social Security for life after they retire. The present value of that is wealth. And uh, that's something that is often not incorporated in the, in, the, in the wealth statistics. And, you know, rich people don't get much more than poor people on that. So it's, tr it's a much trickier measurement question than you're making it out to be. Uh, yeah, go back here. Thank you. I just had a question regarding uh, the role of school choice in public education and funding. Um, I, I guess my question is, what's the role or the, the potential of having school choice in a public education system? I'm a bad person to be the expert on that question, and the reason is that we have two experts on it, Caroline Hoxby and Terry Moe, coming in a couple days, and so I'm going to defer it to them because they are the experts. Good to not talk about things when you don't know what you're talking about. One more over here, yes. Hey, thanks for the conversation. In one of your um, writings, you talked about the value of tax evasion, and it's a topic I hadn't ever covered before, and, and incredibly small, but um, on the topic of charitable, charitable contributions, trust for descendants, what's the topic of conversation happening there, and is it at all a large part? Okay, so are you thinking more about inheritance taxes, or are you thinking about, about uh, you know, abuse of nonprofit uh, organizations? Could go either direction. Okay, or both, or how they work together. Um, you know, the uh, as uh, as uh, John Cochran said, the U.S. tax code is incredibly complex, and I think that the bottom line is, it, you know, we would every, everybody would be much better off if we had a tax code that was just much simpler, with um, you know, if necessary, with with lower tax rates for everybody than something that has a lot of opportunity for very very complex tax evasion. Because people who really actually gain from complex tax avoidance tend to be tax lawyers and tax accountants and, 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 and things like that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of talk now about how much additional money the government can potentially get by, by, the, by investing in the IRS and having the IRS you know, crack down on people. Um, and uh, I think that, um, you know, well, I think it remains to, it remains to be seen. You know, uh, uh, what would be better and more efficient for society would be if we didn't have rules that were that complicated. So it wasn't that hard to actually figure out how much somebody owes in tax. So you don't have to pay $87 billion to figure it out. Let's just have a simpler system where you don't have to invest so much money to figure out how much somebody actually owes in taxes. And that kind of feeds into the whole question about trusts and estates and things like that. So.